Today on the John Ankerberg Show, we will provide answers for those who have abandoned their Christian faith because of science. Somewhere along the line, you were persuaded that the biblical account of creation cannot be reconciled with modern science today. But in this series, we will argue that the latest scientific evidence will actually lead you to believe in God. Further, we will answer the question, should we expect to find agreement between the record of nature and the record of scripture? Sure we should, because it's the same author. I mean, you look at a building that was done by an architect and another building by the same architect, you say, it's a Frank Lloyd Wright building. You look at the universe, it was built by God. It's got all over it, not made in USA, but made by the living God. And you look at the scriptures, that too came from God. Now, the author is the same, interpreters work on both. The interpreters may disagree, but not the evidence, not the raw data itself. The raw data itself comes from the same Lord. Otherwise, we throw away the doctrine of creation. Otherwise, we throw away the inspiration, the full inerrant word of God. We can't throw away either. They both come from the living God. My guest today is astronomer Dr. Hugh Ross, who received his PhD in astronomy from the University of Toronto and did postdoctoral research at Caltech on quasars. He is the author of many books, including his latest, Navigating Genesis. We will also hear from Hebrew scholar Dr. Walter Kaiser, a man thought by many to be one of the world's most knowledgeable authorities on the Old Testament and Hebrew language. Join us and hear how the latest scientific evidence is in agreement with the biblical account of creation in Genesis 1 and 2 on this special edition of The John Ankerberg Show. Welcome to our program. We've got a great one for you today again. Our guest is astronomer and astrophysicist, Dr. Hugh Ross, and we're talking about the Bible and science. Are they compatible? Do they agree? How so? And we're focusing in this program on what is the length of a day. You've got six creative days, and then God rested on the seventh. What is the time length of each of those days? And in order to define that in the context, there are some tip-offs. We've already said that we think that they are long periods of time. Each day is a long period of time. What we're going to look at is, does this apply to the day, the sixth day, when Adam and Eve were created? Did you know there's probably about 10 events that God talks about and gives us information about what He did on this day? Well, we're going to look at that together. And uh, Hugh, let's start with the biblical text. People are going to be surprised when they actually see what the Bible has to say. We're talking about what happened on the sixth day. And in Genesis 2, verse 8, Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east in Eden, and there He put the man he had formed. What does that tell you? Well, it tells us that Adam initially was outside the garden and God put him in the garden. So Adam had the opportunity to see the difference between the world outside the garden and what God had done inside the garden. And I think that communicated to him right away, you know, this God really must care for me and love for me that he made this incredibly beautiful garden uh, for me to enjoy. So that's, I think, is the first key point there. And also when God speaks to him later about death and when he hears about the thorns and thistles, he already knows because he's seen the world outside the Garden of Eden. Yeah, so the garden's going to be a special place. And verse 15 says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden. Right. And he put him there to work it and to take care of it. A lot of information in those words. What's going on? When you look at Genesis 1, it talks about what God did in terms of physical creation. In Genesis 2, God is taking the man and introducing him step by step to what he has created and teaching him how to relate to the different components of creation. Notice in Genesis 1, the text talks about three different kinds of life. 
Life is purely physical, life is physical and soulish, and then the one and only species, it's physical, soulish, and spiritual. So here in the 15th verse is talking about God first introducing Adam to that part of creation is purely physical and teaching him how he is to relate to the physical creation. All right, and then God says in the next verse, the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What does that tell you? Well, first of all, it's telling us that uh, Adam was able to watch the design that God had put into the trees. The text tells us he was able to observe the growth of the trees. So here he is learning what he needs to do to care for the trees and also recognizing the provision that God has given to him through the plants that he had made. I mean, as a scientist, what astounds me, plants overproduce. From a Darwinian perspective, we wouldn't anticipate that plants would produce such abundant food, such tasteful food with such great variety and beauty, but this is something that Adam is learning. These plants are something I've given to you, I've given to you in great abundance and provided to you in such a way that you're gonna really enjoy this. I mean, what of all food had, was a color brown? What of all food tasted like cardboard? Uh, that's not what we see. There's this great variety, great beauty, and great enjoyment that we humans have. Yeah, what struck me too is if you're watching a tree grow, how many minutes are you watching? Well, several years. Yeah, so I mean, it's got to be a longer period of time. And then he's in the garden and God gives him a job. You've, he's surrounded by this beautiful uh, place. And the Bible says the Lord God took the man, put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. Right. I think what's going on there is God's uh, instructing Adam, I've given you work. This work is going to be enjoyable. And so here is Adam actually relating to the physical creation, the plants and the trees and the food and the flowers that they provide. And because this is a garden planted by God, I'm presuming that Adam must have gotten great enjoyment from relating to what God has done. But also God is teaching him there is more. Yeah, uh, the next part here is fascinating. Again, we're still on the sixth day. The Lord God said, you know, it's not good for old Adam here to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. And now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals, all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what Adam would name them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that's what its name was. Now, how long did it take Adam to do that? Well, it's referring to the animals that God created on days five and day six. These are animals that are not just physical, that are endowed by God with emotions, with a will, uh, you know, with uh, intellect, and also designed them with a motivation to relate to human beings and serve and please human beings. And so here's God telling Adam, I want you to relate to all these different creatures, discover how I've designed them to serve and please you, and give them an appropriate name. Now what this means is that Adam is being established as having authority uh, over the plant kingdom, but also authority over these animals, and it's also an opportunity for Adam to discover you know, these animals really are endowed to relate to me in a very powerful way, much more so than the plants. So as fulfilled as he was from gardening, he has now experienced a far greater degree of fulfillment because he's not only being fulfilled physically, but emotionally, volitionally, and intellectually. Yeah, talk about this thing that God created these nephish animals, basically, that what does that mean? I mean, there are people that are watching right now that they love their dog. Right. They love their cat. I mean, you go to the cemetery and you can find statues of their dogs sometimes right next to the guy that's buried there. Right. I'm saying there's this relationship that humans have with some of the animals. The other animals we could care less about, some we do. Why? What's this word nephesh all about? Well, the word nephesh is referring to animals that God created uh, to serve and please us human beings and to emotionally bond to us human beings. 
And the incredible thing about these animals, they want to be around us. You know, take the sin factor out, the abuse factor out. These animals are powerfully motivated to come to us, to relate to us, and to sacrifice to serve and please us. So this must have been a source of great enjoyment uh, for Adam. And then God says, look, I made more than just a few. There are thousands of different species of these netfish creatures. Each one has been designed in a different way to serve and please you. And so this must have been a tremendous source of discovery and enjoyment for Adam, realizing they're all different and they all serve and please me in a different way. And there's a sense of fulfillment he received from that. But obviously this took a significant period of time because it takes time to discover how each of these creatures, each of these species of life has been uniquely designed to serve and please. The book of Job, for example, 38, 38th chapter and 39th chapter goes into this in detail, making the point, for example, that the horse and the donkey, though they look similar to one another, relate to us in radically different ways. Yeah, folks, now as you're listening, how long do you think we are in terms of the amount of hours that to get to Adam where he's at right now? Because this is all one yam, one day, all right? We're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to talk about the big one is on this day. What's coming next is he brought Eve to Adam. And I want you to stay tuned and we're going to do that when we come right back. If you would like to have all of the information in today's series, Step by Step Through Creation, all four half hour programs with astronomer Dr. Hugh Ross, are available on DVD for a gift of $49. And you may order this series now by calling us at 1-800-805-3030. All right, we're back. We're talking with astronomer and astrophysicist, Dr. Hugh Ross, and we're talking about how long were the days in Genesis? And the Bible itself is defining the length of these days by the information that it gives to us. And we're talking about the events that happened on the sixth day when God created Adam and Eve. And we haven't got Eve in the picture yet, and we've been talking about all these events that have happened to Adam. But now we're coming to that spot where Eve is brought in. This is all the same day. And here's what the Bible says. God had given Adam the job of naming all of these animals. And verse 20 says, so the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But then it says, but for Adam, no suitable helper was found. And so God realizes this, what's going on? Well, these animals that God had created, several thousand different species, they have emotions, they have will, volition, uh, they have intellect, but they're lacking the spirit. So Adam was discovering, yes, I can relate to them physically, I can relate to them emotionally, uh, intellectually, volitionally, but there's something missing. These creatures don't have what I have, namely the spirit. And so there's a longing within Adam uh, for a creature that he could relate to at all the levels that God had equipped him to relate. So the Bible tells us the next part here Verse 21, so the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man. And then the text says, he brought this woman to Adam and what happens? He says something that you see in the Hebrew text, the word hapa'am. It's used over 20 times in the Old Testament, consistently translated at long last. So here is God introducing Adam to the full extent of everything he's created on earth, keeping the best for the last. And here is Adam probably spending several months, if not a few years, working the garden, relating to all these animals, naming all these animals, establishing authority over the garden and over all these animals. And then this creature comes and he says, at long last a creature that God has given me that can fulfill me in all the levels that God has equipped me to relate. Yeah. When God brought the woman to the man, the man said, this is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She should be called woman, for she was taken out of man. 
And that's why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. So what's going on here? Well, there's something else there in the text where it tells us that uh, God brought Eve to Adam as a helper or helpmeet, which I think is not a very good translation. The Hebrew word there is ezer, and it means I'm bringing to you a military ally. So that's communicating to Adam right away, okay, God has given me all these animals and plants and now this woman to enjoy in this wonderful garden, but I'm not here just to enjoy life. God is giving us a mission. So when he refers to Eve as a military ally, he's communicating to both the man and the woman, you have a mission, you have a purpose, and uh, that's why you've been created. Let's take a moment to talk about this thing God made Adam and Eve in the image of God. What does that mean? Well, we are body, soul, and spirit. Now, I don't think the soul of a human being can be separated from the spirit, but it's making the point that, you know, as God has all of these features, so do we have all of these features, and therefore we're able to do things that the animals can't do. You also have special creation. Man did not evolve according to God. God brought him into existence. Well, notice the text here is using the word that God created man and he made man. Now, when it talks about God making us, it means he made us from the dust of the earth. That dust already existed, uh, but God organized and transformed that dust into our bodies. But the spirit within us is something that's brand new that never existed before. That's why you see the word create. So this is something that never existed on the face of the earth. Yeah. It's only three times in Genesis 1, isn't it, that you use the word bara, or God correct. uses it. Why? The word bara is exclusively used in Genesis 1 for bringing into existence something brand new that never existed before. So we see it first in Genesis 1-1, where God creates the physical universe. The second time is on the fifth creation day, where God creates animals that are not just physical, but physical and soulish. And it's the soulish part that's brand new. And then last of all, human beings that are body, soul, and spirit. And it's the spirit that's brand new. All right, Hugh, let's summarize why we've given the folks all of this information. You've got all of these events, and I want you to summarize them again. And they're supposed to have happened on the sixth day. What are the events, and why can't that be just a few hours in a 24-hour period of time? Well, Genesis 1 tells us both the human male and the human female were made on the sixth day. But we see in Genesis 2 as Adam's created first, outside the Garden of Eden. God puts him in the garden. He's there long enough to see that these trees are growing. He tends the garden, uh, recognizing just how beautiful God has provided for him through the plants and the trees. Uh, has great enjoyment from that, but also recognizes there's got to be more to life than gardening. And God says, okay, now I want you to relate to not only the physical creation, but the creation that's soulish. This is referring to the nephesh animals, animals that God had designed with mind, will, and emotions so that they could relate to Adam, bond to Adam, but also he gets an opportunity to see how God designed them to serve and please them each in their specific way. Now, there are thousands of these species. This would take a significant period of time for Adam to discover how God has designed each one to serve and please him in a distinct way and to give them an appropriate name. Having done all that, the text tells us that God observes that Adam is alone. That in spite of all this relationship he's having with these animals, something is missing. And this is when God puts Adam to sleep. He recovers from his surgery. He's introduced to a new creature. And we see in the original Hebrew text what comes out of Adam's mouth Hapa'am, at long last. And therefore, this is a significant passage of time between the creation of Adam and the creation of Eve. And it's really God instructing Adam how to relate to the different components of creation we see described in Genesis 1. Hugh, when you are non-Christian and you read this account, somewhere along the line, the information in Genesis chapter 1 got to you. And your whole background was astronomy. And how did you cross the line? What were the big points in this chapter that made you cross the line and put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ to be your savior from sin? 
Well, what I notice in Genesis 1 and 2 is that the order of events perfectly matched the scientific record. The description perfectly matched the scientific record. And I realize that this was written thousands of years ago. This was telling us scientific information far beyond the capability of a mere human being. This is what persuaded me this man Moses had to be inspired by the one that created the universe. And what I see in the Bible is something that's not only inspired, it's all perfectly true. And therefore, recognizing that the Bible is the inspired and errant word of God, I devoured the rest of the text and recognized what I saw in Genesis 3, that the descendant of the woman would crush the head of the serpent, who is the enemy of humanity and the enemy of God, and read in the New Testament, that the creator of the universe himself became a human being and made the sacrifice by which we can regain our relationship with our creator. And that's what motivated me to sign my name in the back of a Gideon Bible, giving my life to Jesus Christ. In about 40 seconds, what is the gospel message? The gospel message is that the one that created everything actually came to earth and showed us an example of humility that we need to come to God but also sacrificed himself, paid the penalty for our offenses against God so that we can come to him and actually trade our moral imperfection for his moral perfection and have him guide our life so we can step by step become a truthful follower of the, of the God that created us. And folks, if you've listened and you want to invite Christ to come into your life, Bible has a lot to say about that, but basically, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, if you will put your trust in Him, that He did everything was, that was necessary for you to be forgiven and to stand perfect before God without any sin or blame, okay? When you put your trust in Christ that He's able to pull that off, God then pulls it off. He saves you. Christ comes into your life. He puts the Holy Spirit of God into your life and He starts to give you new desires and changes you. And we want you to come into that relationship. It's not just intellectual stuff. This is an experience with the living God and walking with Christ every day. Now, this is tremendous information. We still didn't get to what happened on the fourth day, but we're going to talk about that. And we're also going to talk about does the record of nature agree with the record of, of Scripture? In other words, do God and the Bible, do they agree with what we have in nature? Is it the same author giving us both things? And uh, we're going to talk about that. We're going to hear from Dr. Walter Kaiser, but we're also going to talk about some of the questions that surround what happened when Adam sinned? How did this affect the world? And a lot of interesting questions in that area, so I hope that you'll join us next week. Stay tuned for scenes from next week's program. If you would like to have all of the information in today's series called Step by Step Through Creation, all four half hour programs are available on DVD for a gift of $49. You will learn how the latest scientific discoveries agree with the biblical account of creation in Genesis 1 and 2. What is the length of each of the seven creation days? Are they seven 24-hour days or seven consecutive long periods of time? What events happened on the sixth day that indicate it must have been longer than a 24-hour day? And according to the Bible, is the seventh day still going on? All four programs examining the seven creation days in Genesis and the scientific evidence surrounding them are available on DVD for a gift of only $49. Then second, science discovers the universe had a beginning. In this series, you will learn about the latest scientific discoveries that have led astronomers to believe the universe had a beginning, just as Genesis 1-1 declares. You'll learn about the scientific evidence that shows God meticulously designed the sun, the moon, and the stars so man can live safely on the earth, and how God uniquely positioned Jupiter, Saturn, and Neptune to protect the earth. All four programs presenting the scientific evidence of how God created and designed are available on DVD for a gift of $49. Third, we have written two new study guides with extensive notes 
that parallel our two television series. Each study guide contains four sessions for your personal study or Bible study group and is available for a gift of $8 each or for five or more copies for $5 each. And fourth, we are making available the 70-minute documentary movie, Journey Toward Creation, which will transport you by state-of-the-art computer animation out into space and back in time, past stars, galaxies, and quasars, all the way back to the moment the universe came into existence and show you how God meticulously created and designed the universe. This updated second edition movie is available on DVD for $30. And finally, if you wish to order all five of these items together, that is both television series, plus the two study guides, plus the documentary movie, Journey Toward Creation, they are available together in a special package for only $120. And to order now, you may call us at 1-800-805-3030. That's 1-800-805-3030. You may also call that same number on any workday, or you may order these programs now at our website at jashow.org. And during this series, if you would like to compare the Young Earth interpretation of Genesis 1 and 2 with the Old Earth interpretation, you may wish to order The Great Debate on Science and the Bible. The 10 programs in this debate feature Mr. Ken Ham, president of Answers in Genesis, and astronomer Dr. Jason Lyle, representing Young Earth creationism. They debate astronomer Dr. Hugh Ross, and Hebrew professor Dr. Walter Kaiser, representing the day-age view. The Great Debate on Science and the Bible is available on DVD for a gift of $49. And to order this series now, just call us at 1-800-805-3030. That's 1-800-805-3030. Next week on The John Inkerberg Show, well, what happens when I speak to an audience, say, of several hundred atheists is like, we've never heard these evidences before. The most common comment I got is, I'm no longer secure in my atheism. to learn how to start a relationship with Jesus Christ, go to our website at jashow.org and click on Pray to Accept Jesus Christ as Your Savior.